Should Trump now be accusing the Times of inventing unnamed sources and reporting that his campaign is flailing? Or are the mainstream media just piling on? New York Times media columnist admits the coverage of Trump is unbalanced, but says that's understandable because many journalists view him as potentially daily and favor-seeking State Department and the Clinton Foundation. But is that story being drowned out by the uproar over Trump? Plus, NBC and other media outlets under fire for belittling or sexist coverage of female athletes at the Olympics. We'll have a scorecard. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. think he was it would be dangerous if he was president Donald Trump is, in my judgment would make a perilous world even more dangerous it's called Donald well in any to the language that he has used in the campaign I fear for our future but that was wiped off the media radar when Trump went to a North Carolina rally and made this attack. Hillary wants to abolish, essentially abolish, the Second Amendment. By the way, and if she gets to pick... If she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. But, but I'll tell you what, that will be a horrible day. Trump riled up the press again by calling Clinton a founder of ISIS. And then, last night, he said this. The New York Times, okay? I love it. And they wrote a story today. Anonymous sources have said, three anonymous sources, anonymous this, anonymous that. They don't use names. I don't really think they have any names, okay? Joining us now to analyze the campaign coverage, Heidi Presbella, Silicon UA today, both a Republican strategist and a contributor to the Washington Examiner, and Kirsten Powers, Fox News contributor and a columnist for USA Today. Heidi, that New York Times story that Trump was calling fiction, uh, quoted a lot of anonymous sources, said he remains a crudely effective political showman, but aides think he may be on coaching and that he's not a plausible president. Your take on the story and Trump's response. This is obviously a story that was not just reported overnight. Howie. And it wasn't just for anonymous sources. Over the course of however long they've been reporting this, this is an evolution that we've all been watching in terms of Trump's advisors trying to get him to do things that maybe he, he didn't do during the primary campaign. Um, that said, it comes in the midst of what is undoubtedly a media pylon. And so I think Trump kind of took this one story uh, and is reacting to it in a very emotional way in going after the New York Times. But the truth of the matter is, Howie, to report, and you know this, to report a story like this, you have to use anonymous sources. People who are in the campaign and who are worried about the direction of the campaign are not going to tell you that on the record. So that's the only way that a story like this can be reported. That's why I think that deeper in the body of the story, the Times did mention that they had talked to 20 people. In fairness to the Times, there were three uh, Trump advisors like Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani uh, on the record as well as the campaign communications director. But this kind of, I mean, Trump is basically saying this is Jason Blair territory and making stuff up as opposed to just saying the story is intricately. You think the discrediting cycles or he's worked in campaigns, clearly there's been bias, uh, you know, throughout a, a large period of time. I'm with newspapers and other public locations, but I think we've seen they've been utterly transparent parent in their bias this election cycle. I think this is the reason that 20% of Americans have confidence in newspaper that people paint this election cycle with that. Uh, they ran a story about women, women and Donald Trump. And one of the interviewees actually stepped forward and said that her words were taken out of context, that it was not true, that she was misled by the reporter himself. You look at uh, the fact that the New York Times ran an almost 1300 page article on his Second Amendment comments, but did nothing about a terrorist father attending or endorsing well, we'll, Hillary Clinton. We'll so get to that we'll get in the next that, second. But they have shown their bias this election cycle. Um, a Trump campaign insider told me, Kirsten Powers, that uh, this is a case of people at least close to Trump, if not within the campaign itself, who are kind of distancing themselves from what they fear 
will be a loss in November. The fact that that, that these leaks are taking place, we don't know who the sources are. What does that tell you about the relationship between the campaign and the media? The campaign report let perfect newspaper, but I wouldn't put his Second Amendment comments on the same level as some person showing up at a Hillary Clinton rally with her, somebody who she basically said she didn't want his support. It's not really the same thing. The yeah, other we'll thing, get, I, would we'll say, have more on that thing I would say here is I've known Maggie Haberman for I don't know, 15 years probably. She's covered campaigns that I've worked on. I know her well. She's a first-rate reporter. The idea that somehow she's making up sources here is beyond preposterous. And also the New York Times, I know, has a very rigorous process. They don't get to just make up sources. They don't get to just say somebody said something. That's just not the but way it works there. who are those sources? I mean, they it's could not... be people on the lower tier that have no involvement, who have never even sat in a room with Donald Trump. We don't know who those well, sources are. Well, I know, are. but that's a, a good reporter isn't going to just take an intern and But I think them. the New York Times they're has already discredited to, themselves with, well, I, for instance, I don't think the story that's about true. women. I think that's actually kind of character assassination against a great reporter. Well, I mean, the, I, the, the story said that four of the sources had detailed knowledge. or certain meetings, which did seem to be pretty closely held. By the way, Trump said that he might yank the credentials of the New York Times. He told me that two months ago. He doesn't seem to want to do it. It's his whole the oxygen this week, obviously, were the Second Amendment comments. Uh, you've all seen and heard it. But here's an interview uh, that Trump did with radio host Hugh Hewitt, conservative radio host, in which Hewitt pressed him on the nature of those comments. Take a listen. Last night, you said the president was the founder of ISIS. I know what you meant. You meant that he created the vacuum. He lost the peace. No, I meant he's the founder of ISIS. I was Vag Player Award. I give her, too, by the way. But he's not said. sympathetic to them. He hates them. He's trying to I kill them. It, it, he was the founder. So this seems to me to fall into the category of the political license. I mean, does anyone really believe that Trump is literally saying that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton founded, um, founded ISIS? Uh, at the same time, CNN put up a banner um, that, that actually basically called Trump a liar, saying he isn't, meaning Obama isn't the founder of ISIS. What do you make of this? This is part of a broader change that we've had to make in this campaign cycle about covering Donald Trump, is, which is that a lot of the statements that he says that are not sarcasm, because he later said this is sarcasm, are just factually incorrect. So the news organizations have taken to live fact-checking. In this case, he later came back and said, well, that was sarcastic. But he said it on so many occasions that we, as the media, have to report that what he's saying is literal when he tells us that it's literal in several interviews as as he did well let's put up the tweet where trump said because he was criticizing cnn's coverage of it ratings challenge cnn reports so seriously that i call president obama and clinton the founder of isis and mvp they don't get sarcasm but lisa then at a rally after that he said well obviously i'm being sarcastic but not that sarcastic. So what are the media to make of w where this falls on the sarcasm? Well, the, the problem is CNN also doesn't do that fact-checking element when Hillary Clinton rarely does interviews, when she actually does interviews. Even though we know that Hillary Clinton has systematically and methodically lied to the American people for a year and a half throughout the FBI's investigation. So, you know, that's that's the problem here. And then further, you know, I think there was a level of hyper, uh, hyperbole to his statement, but, the crux of, of, but yeah. the crux of what he is saying is that President Obama left a vacuum for ISIS. This is something that has been uh, reiterated by someone like Leon Panetta, who served under President Obama, who has said on record that President Obama's uh, leaving Iraq left a vacuum for ISIS. That's so a it's fair, something that's been that's reiterated fair, by his own uh, defense secretary. That's a fair charge. But Hugh Hewitt gave him the opportunity to say that. He says, no, no, I'm saying founder well, of and ISIS. I, and as I conceded, but, there was a level yes, of uh, hyperbole there. He also there. said it at least seven times. I mean, so so why did he not just say that at some point, what Lisa just said? Why didn't he, in all those other times, just explain that? That's not what he did. And then he said it was sarcasm. But so I feel like the people who want to clean up his mess are saying that this is what he, he meant, but he's not saying Let me read you a tweet that I saw just before we came on the air. This, again, is the real Donald Trump account on Twitter. Uh, if the disgusting and corrupt media covered me honestly and didn't put false meaning into the words I say, I would be beating Hillary by 20%. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. I, I've sat on this set and said that I thought the media has been was hard on Trump many months ago. 
I cannot sit there today and say that anyone's being hard on him in this situation. He is not being hard on him, or that you're saying it's justified? Un unfairly hard. Unfairly yeah, I mean, I, I think that they were maybe, yeah. you know, going overboard with him. When he's coming out and saying the kinds of things he's saying and then trying to tell us that it's sarcasm, it's, it's moving into a realm that I think is, is getting a little crazy. But making. the point, the, 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 I think that there's an important point that's missing here, though. The, the media should be able to cover what Donald Trump says, and I, I've said before that I think he overstates things, you know, and, and so I don't completely you know, put that on the media. some of his own some, problems. Yeah, to, to some extent, yes, I've conceded that before. But the problem is the media should be adept enough to be able to cover that while simultaneously covering the stuff that Hillary Clinton has. But there's not an equal amount of fact-checking. There's not an equal amount of criticism that's being applied to well, Donald Trump at, and Hillary Clinton. They should look, be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Fact, look at Politica Fact did a mid-year review, like a roundup of all of the statements of the candidates. Already itself and 70% well. of the statements by Trump were false compared to 20-something percent by Hillary Clinton. We, so, we, let me jump in here because we're short on time. We will get into Hillary Clinton in a segment later in the program. I just want to put up this Time Magazine cover this week meltdown and you see the melting face. So that seems to me that the, the, the mainstream media have now concluded that not only is Trump behind and is he uh, creating a lot of problems for himself, but he's going to lose this campaign. And I wonder if that is a trap that we're falling into since it is August. They have accused him, let's go take a walk down memory lane here, of melting down those exact words on several occasions. Um, and time has, uh, you know, likes to push the envelope with its covers. I saw one uh, about Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, back during the email scandal that was pretty provocative before there was even an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, that said, I think, you know, we have to wait for several more weeks of polling, um, as well as look at other factors, like the fact that he is still taking in a lot of money. Um, before we can necessarily all kind of jump on that melting down bandwagon. But I think when you are struggling like you are in the in the poll numbers right now, you're going to invite headlines. All right, let me get a break here. Uh, we will come back to this a little later with you, panel. Uh, also, uh, continue the conversation on Twitter at Howard Kurtz. Write to us, mediabuzz at foxnews.com. And when we come back, are some pundits using the latest polls to predict that Trump is actually toast? Trish Regan is up next. And later is all the Trump, Trump, Trump coverage overshadowing Hillary Clinton's latest email mess. Host of the Intel Report at 2 Eastern on Fox Business from New York. Trish Regan, welcome. Hey, how we good to see you. Let's start with the polling prognosticators. Nate Silver says that Hillary Clinton has an 87% chance of winning this election. New York Times upshot blog, a little more pessimistic. Hillary has only an 86% chance of winning this election. <laughs> Everybody writes off the latest polls. Could these numbers and the coverage become a self-fulfilling prophecy against Donald Trump? You know, I've been thinking about that a lot, Howie, um, and that's why we as journalists need to be extraordinarily cautious, I think, uh, over the next several weeks as we get closer to November, because uh, keep in mind, anything can happen, right? You think back to Dukakis, 1988, mm -hmm. he was actually ahead in the polls in August, but wound up nowhere near the Oval Office. So in other words, the, the onus is on us as journalists to be cautious about not effectively making this a fait accompli. I could not agree more. Now, what about the sheer imbalance in the coverage? I mean, there's absolutely no denying it. You look at any newspaper, websites, most cable shows, it's Trump, 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 and then Hillary is maybe the fourth or fifth story. <laughs> well, you know, part of that is because Trump's selling papers, right? Or uh, landing Flakes, ratings on television ratings, networks. Yeah. So, so the media likes to cover Trump. But I, I think one thing that I find frustrating in the process is that there's not enough policy coverage. It's all just sort of, what did he say lately? Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump both gave major economic speeches. Now, if you're not working for a business network, uh, my sense mm -hmm. is they got a half day of coverage, maybe a little bit more. But is there a tendency by particularly political journalists to shy away from the details of tax plans and estate tax and marginal tax rates and carried interest because it's hard to explain, particularly on television? Yeah, I'll go a step further. I think a lot of them just don't even understand it, Howie. And they choose not to understand it, and they deliberately shy away from getting into the nuts and bolts of tax policy because it's just, frankly, too complicated for them. And I think that's a very, very sad thing. It is incredibly important uh, that we take on the responsibility of making sure that we understand all of these policies, especially on the economy. I mean, think about it. This is the biggest issue in this election, and we need change 
change when it comes to the economic future because our economy is in such a bad state. So what are the things that Hillary Clinton is proposing? What are the things that Donald Trump is proposing? And what will they mean for our economy? And yet no one, uh, frankly, you know, other than us, wants to cover that. But if they don't understand it or choose not to understand it, um, isn't it also perhaps a fear that people will turn the dial, that uh, economic policy can be dry and abstract, and let's go to, you know, the latest Donald Trump They're said so Hillary Clinton is the founder of ISIS. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, they are so absolutely wrong. I mean, it, I can tell you, I see it every day on this show. Viewers respond to substance. They really do, and it is short-sighted of members of the media to think that viewers won't care about economic policy because, again, this is the thing that everybody cares about. I mean, how are you, how you going to you know, feed your family? How are you going to make sure that your kids have a brighter future than what you have? These are the issues that voters want information on. And so, uh, you know, for the media to say, okay, we're not going to cover that because we don't think it's going to rate, they're wrong. Let me jump over the last question, about half a minute. Um, so what about the argument that some journalists are making that, you know, Donald Trump, we've never seen a candidate like him. He's always stepping in and he's always saying factually challenged things. Therefore, we need to give him a lot more scrutiny than we give to Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I think they do give him a lot more scrutiny. I don't think it's because he's stepping in it. I think it's because they, they don't really like him. Um, and, and that, in fact, is coloring some of their reporting. Uh, what I would recommend is, you know, regardless of what you think of either candidate, it is up to us to scrutinize very carefully both of these folks. And you can't give anyone a pass just because you may like their policies a little more. Uh, and I think that we see that from mainstream media quite a bit, Howie. Or just because one candidate's been around in the political scene for a lot longer. Trish Regan, always great to see you. Good to see you too, Howie. Thanks very much. You bet. Ahead are some media outlets being condescending to the female athletes winning medals in Rio. But first, big changes at the Huffington Post and at Fox News, plus the crazy climber who hijacked cable news. Up. The Huffington Post, now owned by Verizon, has become a global force with more than 100 million monthly visitors. And though it regularly fails to turn a profit and gets much of its material by linking to others, it did win a Pulitzer four years ago and is an undeniable success. Huffington, a conservative in the 90s who became an unabashed liberal, originally described the site as a forum for many voices, but HuffPost long ago became consistently left-wing. Every story about Donald Trump has an editor's note saying he's a liar, racist, misogynist, and worse. And closer to home, Rupert Murdoch, who took over as chairman of Fox News after Roger Ailes' resignation, has just announced his new management team. The network will have two co-presidents. One is Bill Schein, a 20-year veteran who had been in charge of all programming for FNC and Fox Business Network. He'll now be overseeing all content at both channels. The other co-president, Jack Abernethy, who is now CEO of Fox Television Stations and will oversee the business side. Now, since Ailes' negotiated departure in the wake of a sexual harassment lawsuit, there's been plenty of reporting and speculation in the media, not just about the Gretchen Carlson suit and other allegations that have surfaced, but about the impact on Fox. The promotion of these two insiders and the deputies right under them shows that Murdoch wants to bring stability to the place after this major upheaval and that the network isn't changing its direction. Well, cable news got hijacked the other day by a 19-year-old guy from Virginia who climbed up Trump Tower, and despite the apparent lack of danger, this was considered mesmerizing. This is 56th Street and 5th Avenue in New York City. It's Trump Tower where some guy, we don't know who, is climbing the side of uh, Trump Tower. We're watching that situation at the Trump Tower in New York City. He's now this individual climber outside the building has made it up to the 16th floor, past the 16th floor right now. He's still uh, moving up. Police are trying to talk some sense into him. Breaking news right at this hour out of New York City. A man, look at this, is climbing Trump Tower in Manhattan. He's using suction cups to make his way up the side of the building. Good grief. Good grief. This went on and on. Stephen Rogato, who's been arrested and charged, said he wanted to give the Donald a message, but he must be a little dim since Trump was out of state campaigning. But he did send a message that if you pull a stupid stunt like this, you can be famous on TV, at least till the cops grab you. Coming up, new emails reveal a favor-seeking environment involving Hillary Clinton's State Department and the Clinton Foundation. Is that story getting enough media scrutiny? And later, a spectacular defense of newspapers by that noted journalistic champion, John Oliver.
Cat Allen. It has all the elements of a big story. Previously secret emails revealing a cozy, favor-seeking relationship between Hillary Clinton's State Department and the folks at the Clinton Foundation. See? Later, Secretary Clinton, allegations of big donors to the Clinton Foundation paying for State Department access, and yes, newly released emails. This was a pay-for-play uh, operation. Basically, people solicited the Clinton Foundation, they gave money to the Clinton Foundation, and got the State Department to weigh in on various disputes uh, and, and matters. But the reporting on this tangled web between the Democratic nominee, her top government aides, and allies at her husband's foundation has paled in comparison to the tsunami of Trump coverage. We're back with the panel. Kirsten, are these latest uh, emails uh, obtained by Judicial Watch a big story, and do they deserve more coverage? I think, yeah, I do think they're a big story. They have been covered, but they could stand to have more coverage. And likely they did not get as much coverage as they should have because Donald Trump was making new news basically every five minutes. <laughs> I was going to say every so, hour, but I think you're yeah, right. Yeah, and so he just, you know, he, he, he constantly is giving the media some new outrage um, and is sort of stepping on any bad news that's coming out for the Clinton campaign. So if Trump had taken a few days off, then there might have been more scrutiny. Of I think so, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I definitely think so. And I think I said I did get some coverage, but I think it would have gotten more coverage if they weren't so busy dedicating most of their time to Trump. At least I think you kind of tipped your hand on this in the earlier segment, but do you believe the media are intentionally playing down these emails, or is it just that the story has been simply overshadowed by all of the every, uh, controversies that swirl around Trump? I think they're absolutely covering up for Hillary Clinton. You look at ABC, covering CBS. Covering up is a strong charge. Well, and I, I, I stand by it. I think that you look at the coverage of ABC, CBS, and NBC. They gave two times more coverage to the Trump Tower climber than they did these new revelations on Hillary Clinton's emails. Hillary Clinton is the only presidential candidate to have been have two FBI investigations, one on her email server, and now this new uh, revelation that there is an F investigation into public corruption charges with the Clinton Foundation. She has quite literally put our national security security at risk, potentially risking lives as well with the information that's based on her server. But somehow this hyperbole and rhetoric gets more attention than actions that have put our nation at risk. Would you agree that some news outlets, including the big newspapers and cable news networks, have covered the story in some substantial detail? I think to an extent, but not enough. I mean, she's facing two FBI, has faced two FBI investigations, and she's the Democratic nominee. That is mind-boggling to me. What jumped out at me, Heidi, is the way that there was a big donor, a, a, a foreign guy who wanted to get a meeting with someone at the State Department, and suddenly Hillary's top aides are at it. I mean, I think the meeting never ended up taking place. But was the news value here undercut at all by the fact that there was no incriminating email that was released, at least in this round, by, written by Hillary Clinton herself? All right. Well, it's involving her aides, but they are her closest aides, right, from a, from Aberdeen and right. Cheryl Mills. So, so like Kristen says, there, there's definitely, this merits a lot of attention, and, but in these specific e emails, not only was it not Hillary Clinton writing the emails, but there, these are not, this is not textbook pay to play in that you can't take it to its logical conclusion that there was some favor given on behalf of this, this donor. But the question is, what more is there to come out, and the media does need to be really vigilant about this She's because there's more there's though. more emails that may come out as part from WikiLeaks or from the Russian hackers, and so we have to keep on this 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 narrative just as strong as we are on you know the daily kind of like incendiary comments that Trump makes because Lisa's right it's serious if there is pay to play there, but we have not seen textbook pay to pay to play in these emails. But she's facing another investigation regarding the Clinton Foundation. I mean Donald Donald. Trump's not facing, has not faced two FBI investigations. I mean, this is huge but news. I just like, seated your point that we need yeah. to, we need to follow these you. investigations. She's agreeing with you. <laughs> but it's still not getting enough attention. Well, another story that has gotten a lot of chatter this week, and it's been covered more on Fox than on the other cable news networks, is about the father of the Orlando mass murderer showing up at a public event for Hillary Clinton, uninvited. Mm -hmm. Campaign says it didn't know about it. And this generated some coverage and chatter. I'm having trouble understanding why it's a story if he wasn't invited and the campaign didn't know about it, but maybe you can set me straight. It, well, I, I think we see it the same way. It, you know, and, I, and the idea that Donald Trump has come out and criticized Hillary for this when he has all these supporters who are white supremacists and he doesn't feel any need to disavow them, and yet somehow some guy showing up to a Hillary Clinton event, she needs to disavow him, which she actually ended up doing. But first of all, um, you're not suggesting that many Trump supporters are white supremacists. I would say white supremacist websites 
are frequently posting stuff in favor of Donald Trump. They have attacked, made anti-Semitic attacks against reporters who have even gotten off of Twitter because they've been so attacked. He's been asked about that and he still has refused to criticize them. But, so the idea that he's going to come out and claim that there's some problem with some guy showing up to Hillary Clinton's event, which, by the way, she did disavow anyway. She did disavow, just as Trump disavowed when David Duke endorsed him. Can, can campaigns be held responsible for any loon who wants to uh, well, offer support? But the, the problem here is that the David Duke endorsement got six times the media coverage of a terrorist father endorsing uh, Hillary Clinton and attending her rally, because we all know that if he had attended a Donald Trump rally, that would be front page news the next day and would all but completely discredit his campaign. So that's the problem. But I would have a problem with that, too. I mean, if it's not somebody that was invited by the campaign. And then and then further to, to, to that logic, um, to lump Donald Trump in with uh, these white supremacists, then by the same logic, you would have to say, well, then why isn't Hillary Clinton? Hillary Clinton should denounce, uh, you know, people among the Black Lives Matter movement who have said statements like pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. The, the reality is there's just not an equal amount of they scrutiny applied to. There's no evidence to, that they're Hillary Clinton supporters. She's, she's no, because that's not, the no, Black but that's not, movement, that's, not, but that's not the same thing. What I think I'm, it's what the I'm same talking, logic. What I'm talking about are people not, who are attacking people, making anti-Semitic attacks against reporters because, in one case, the, they're mad at the fact that the reporter wrote an anti-Melania piece, allegedly, and they're, and then he is asked about this, and he basically says, I don't have anything got, to say I've to my fans. I've got just a few seconds that's left for Heidi. Thing. Uh, I was actually in the motorcade when this went down in Hillary Clinton's motorcade, and I can tell you uh, proof positive that it, they were just as shocked as everyone else that that he was there because having covered you know 16 years of these campaigns, I know that the way these things work is that anybody who wants to wait in line for three hours and go through a metal detector can wind up standing behind the platform. Yes, sometimes they do put their supporters there as well, but that literally the campaign was shocked to, to learn this I, along with the rest. I, I, I don't think yeah. it got to end it there. <laughs> At a time. <laughs> Heidi, Press Bella, Lisa Booth, Kirsten Powers will continue this offline. Up next, a debate about the New York Times columnist who's okay with the media tilting against Trump because he's such an unorthodox candidate. And later, the Daily Beast apologizes for a story that outed gay Olympic athletes. Tilting against Donald Trump, at least according to New York Times media columnist Jim Rudenberg, who acknowledged that in a piece this week and appeared to justify it, saying, this is the situation facing journalists. If you view a Trump presidency as something that's potentially dangerous, then your reporting is going to reflect that. You would move closer than you've ever been to being oppositional. And that's acceptable, says Rutenberg. Quote, it would be an abdication of political journalism's most solemn duty to ferret out what candidates will be like in the most powerful office in the world. It may not always seem fair to Mr. Trump or his supporters. Joining us now from Charlottesville, Virginia, Larry Sabato, director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia. So, Larry, do you agree with the premise here that there has been a definite media tilt against Donald Trump? Yes. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but look, Howie, uh, there was a media tilt against Mitt Romney. There was a media tilt against John McCain. There was a media tilt against George W. Bush. Uh, it has more to do with party and personal characteristics of journalists than anything else. All right. So you believe that uh, the press generally unfair Republican presidential candidates. But of course, I've never seen anything like this level of uh, vitriol. And some of it may be uh, caused by Trump with the statements he makes. So here's the argument. And Jim Rutenberg is a good reporter. The New York Times put this column on the front page. Reporters think Trump is dangerous or would be dangerous as president. And it's their patriotic duty to stop him, except they're not commentators. They're not activists. They're reporters. Yeah. See, I, I think that's a very important distinction. If you're a commentator or a pundit, you can say whatever you want, and uh, the Chiron should read analysis. That, that's what you're doing, or analysis on a newspaper headline. But uh, if you are a straight reporter, if you're supposed to just uh, report the facts of what's happening at a particular event, then I think it's, it's more problematic. Well, I ask you about all this because people don't know that you have a minor degree in press criticism. You once wrote a book called Feeding Frenzy. This Rutenberg column quotes a top <laughs> political editor at uh, the New York Times, Carolyn Ryan, is saying that Trump's candidacy is extraordinary and precedent-shattering, and to pretend otherwise is to be disingenuous with readers. Now, I'm not arguing for false equivalency here. If Trump says four disputed things and Hillary says one, so be it. That's the way we cover it. But when you talk about being close to oppositional, it seems to almost be coming out and saying publicly that 
some journalists, many journalists, believe that they have to be tougher on Trump because of the nature of his candidacy. Your thoughts? Well, it, the uh, political party is the, the other political party is the opposition to Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton is the oppositional candidate. The press is not the oppositional party, and they shouldn't pretend to be the oppositional party. What they will say, and, and I agree with them in part, this campaign, the Trump campaign, uh, has no precedent, Howie. There's nothing in American political history like it. I, I don't know why he doesn't adopt the theme song from the real chairman of the board, Frank Sinatra, my way, because he's doing everything his way. Uh, and it, it, it is difficult even to adjust to if you've been covering politics for a while. Yeah, well, his way obviously worked in the primaries, but he's having a tougher time in general election. He has been stepping up the rhetoric against the press. Let me play you something uh, that he said at a rally just the other day. The media is unbelievably dishonest. I would actually say that the media is almost as crooked as crooked Hillary Clinton. So you think that these kinds of attacks on the press, which are intensifying, as I say, help Donald Trump? Uh, Howie, they're counterproductive, and, and you know that you've got such a long history in the press. First of all, he makes no distinctions between and among members of the press. Uh, reporters are human beings. This will come as a shock to some people, but reporters are human beings. And while they steel themselves to a certain degree against criticism, uh, still, it's, it's a lot. When you have a candidate pointing you out in rallies filled with thousands and thousands of activists and saying you're evil, you're crooked, you're bad, and then you have individual Trump supporters coming up and screaming and yelling at them while they're trying to do their jobs. That is wrong, and he's encouraging it, and he needs to stop it in his own interests. Even in individual news organizations, there are fair reporters, there are not so fair reporters, there are commentators. I do agree that those distinctions should be made. Larry Sabato, great to see you this Sunday from Virginia. Thank you, Howie. Have a great day. After the break, a woman wins an Olympic medal and her husband gets the credit. That and more on the Rio coverage next. NBC and other media outlets taking plenty of heat for the way they depict female athletes at the Olympics. NBC Chief Marketing Officer John Miller explaining why the network packages the events, which are sometimes delayed, with those soft focus features about those competing. He said this, more women watch the games than men, and for the women, they're less interested in the result and more interested in the journey. It's sort of like the ultimate reality show and miniseries wrapped into one. Joining us now from New York, Lola Oganaki, a host at Arise News and a Today Show contributor. So what do you think of the argument? Others have made it that women are different. We've got to tell them nice stories so they'll watch the Olympics. Um, I think it's ridiculous. I think anyone that's tuning in to watch the Olympics does enjoy the stories, but they, more than anything, they enjoy the, watching the competition. They enjoy watching superior athletes leave everything on the floor, blood, sweat, and tears. That's what they tune in for. They want to see the, the, the built-in drama that goes into the competition. They're not there for a reality show. It's not an episode of The Bachelor or Survivor. It's the Olympics. <laughs> that was a gold medal answer. Let me get you to some specifics Thank you. Here. Thank you. All right, so, Tens all around. <laughs> so uh, when a woman won the trap shooting bronze, the Chicago Sun-Times reported it this way. Corey Cogdell Unrein, -Un wife of Chicago Bears defensive end Mitch, wins bronze. And the second paragraph. Her husband, Bears defensive end Mitch Unrein, cheered her from his home near Chicago. They've been married for two years. What? Your thoughts? It's really difficult for some people to understand female athletes without the proxy of a male. So a female athlete either has to be the wife of, the daughter of, the mother of. <laughs> she can't simply just be a female athlete. And can you imagine if the same sort of language is used to describe a male athlete? No one ever describes Michael Phelps as son of, husband of, fiance of. He's just Michael Phelps. No one, ever, no one has ever referred to Michael Phelps as the male Katie Ledecky. <laughs> but Katie Ledecky is always referred to as the female Michael Phelps. Why is that, Howie? I don't understand it. It makes no sense. Katie she Ledecky doesn't swim is like a man. Amazing. She is Katie Ledecky. She's, from She's an amazing the... athlete right. in her own right. And that's it. All right. Here's another example for you. So a uh, Hungarian swimmer, I hope I don't uh, blow this name, Katinka Husu, she won the gold. And NBC's Dan Hicks said that her husband and coach was the guy responsible uh, for her performance. He later said, well, it was impossible to tell Katinka's story accurately without giving appropriate credit to Shane, her husband. You're kind of making your and point. That's, 
And it's, listen, <laughs> was he in the pool with her? Did he drag her across the finish line? I don't think so. I mean, he was there to support her. He was there to, you know, be a great champion for his wife. And that's about it. I mean, I just don't understand. I mean, my favorite, though, is from the San Jose Mercury huh? about Simone Manuel. The headline read, Michael Phelps shares historic night with African-American. That was so was nice of Michael Phelps. What a guy. <laughs> All right. I so do want to mention of him. <laughs> I do want to mention that the Daily Beast uh, deleted and apologized for a piece uh, after a reporter used dating apps like Tinder to arrange hookups with gay Olympic athletes, not only outing them, but in some cases endangering them because in those countries or some of those countries, gay sex is illegal. The Beast said that we screwed up, and that's true. Our quick final question for you, former Olympic gymnast medalist uh, Sean Johnson said, tired of the uh, devastating scrutiny on female athletes, what they wear, how fat or thin they are, whether or not they're pretty. Does that resonate with you? I'm sorry, Sean, what was the question? Whether or not the, the focus on whether or not the female athletes are fat or thin or pretty, the appearance question. Is there too much of that? Listen, we should just focus on their performance. That's it. These women are not there to entertain men. They're not there to titillate the audience. They're there to compete. They are leaving every, they're making, they're breaking records. Right. They're creating historic moments. That's solely what they're there for. All if right. you're looking for a beauty contest, tune into a beauty contest. Got Watch. it. Thank you so <laughs> much, Oganaki. And <laughs> Thank still you. To come, still to come, John Oliver on how TV news really, really leans on newspapers. And what really happened when Frank Luntz on this set threw a phone. Local newspapers are financially struggling as they try to adapt to the online world. HBO's John Oliver has a terrific take on why this matters to you, even if you get your news from TV or Facebook or Twitter or a bunch of websites. Those places are often just repackaging the work of newspapers, and it is not just websites. Watch how often TV news ends up citing print sources. According to the Chicago Tribune. According to the Detroit Free Press. According to the San Francisco Chronicle. According to the Times Picayune. The Boston Globe. The Orlando Sentinel. The Philadelphia Inquirer. The Pittsburgh Tribune Review. The Detroit News. And the Houston Chronicle reports. The Los Angeles Times reports. The Oklahoman reports. The Hartford Current reports. The Salt Lake Tribune reports. It's pretty obvious. Without newspapers around to cite, TV news would just be Wolf Blitzer endlessly batting a ball of yarn around. <laughs> The shrinking business also means fewer reporters checking up on the state houses and city halls and county councils, and it even affects comedians. Whenever this show is mistakenly called journalism, it is a slap in the face to the actual journalist whose work we rely on. But John Alva, I have to say, does a pretty good imitation of a good journalist. Frank Luntz was on the program last week talking about Donald Trump slipping in the latest polls when he got a little carried away. In fact, give me your phone. You got your phone right there. If I were Trump strategist, I would absolutely take the phone and I would throw it away. I would dump it. Now, many of you took to Twitter to ask about the condition of my poor iPhone, but Frank engaged in a little sleight of hand there, tossing his own uh, phone to the floor, not mine. He says his phone was damaged and that cut into his tweeting. Good thing my little iPhone here was spared from his intemperate moment. And it's a good thing that I have this as a backup. I know what people think BlackBerry is unfashionable, but it's good for email. That's it for this edition of Media Buzz. I'm Howard Kurtz. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll like our Facebook page. We post a lot of original content there. You can be part of the Your Buzz feature. I respond to your questions uh, on video. Media Buzz at foxnews.com. Media Buzz at foxnews.com. Give our page a like. Follow me on Twitter at Howard Kurtz. DVR the show. Got many, many ways that we can get through to you. Uh, we are back here next Sunday, 11 and 5 Eastern. We hope you'll join us then in this crazy campaign. Crazy campaign is like drinking from a fire hose. A new story every single hour, every five minutes. Back here next Sunday with the latest buzz.